Hey, what's up? I'm Tyler. I'm the host of the YouTube show Draw and Talk and the creator of The Girl at the Mega Fist, which is currently out on Kickstarter. And you are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creator. He's not only a creator of comics, he is also a podcast host. He is a very talented individual in both of those. We're joined today by the ever-talented Tyler Carpenter, creator of The Girl with the Mega Fist, which sounds more like a Wu-Tang album than it does a comic book, but it's still an <laughs> awesome concept and, and a comic as well too by the way how are you doing today i'm doing good how are you doing <laughs> doing good <laughs> for those that don't know anything about the girl with the mega fist tell us what it's all about yeah the the girl with the mega fist is the story of um it's the epic tale of eliana who she's been chosen by the gods to wield the all-powerful mega fist there's just these gauntlets on her arm um and she's tasked to protect earth alongside a partner that has been presented by the gods however um the gods have have uh, chosen two twin brothers um of which eliana must choose uh which one of these brothers she's going to take down to earth and serve with um and you know the, co the common conflict that's going to be throughout the entire you know couple volumes is does she choose the brother who's gonna who wields the powers of the almighty the best or is she going to choose the brother that has her heart and on top of that you know they have a responsibility she has a responsibility to get as strong as she can so she can go down and be earth's hero for a certain time and so she has to choose a brother to go down with and which one is she going to bring the one who's the best for the task or is she going to choose the one that has her heart that's essentially the story of the growth oh, of megaphone that's awesome i mean i it is funded by the way if i recall correctly if I'm yeah we funded in 15 thing. minutes <laughs> that's amazing congratulations yeah. on thank that. thank you you know is this your first kickstarter campaign that you've put together no no this is my fifth or sixth okay yeah i haven't done a kickstarter in a year so i think i'm, I'm trying to get back into the whole i'm trying to let everyone know that i'm back and that i exist um, last year I did a Kickstarter for a book called chefs. It was really popular and then funded in three hours. And then three days in, I just didn't have like the heart for the story anymore. And I didn't believe in what I was doing. I canceled the campaign, gave everyone their money back, which shocked like everyone. And then I took like a year off. I kind of just disappeared for a couple months in these months. I created the girl with the mega fist, formulated a new plan for me as a creator. Now here we are with the girl with the mega fist. And now everyone's always shocked. Usually when you have a successful campaign, you know, you're, you're kind of all in, but why were you just concerned about the story and, and about the creative process of that comic? My big thing was at the time I was, I was struggling with the fact that I'm, I'm someone who can produce comics. Mm -hmm. I can, but I can produce them really fast. So the girl with the mega fist, I did 200 pages of that book and I did it in six months sorry, five months. I was able to do it because it's black and white. And so I was like, man, I want to be able to tell stories that are very long and entertaining with the book Chefs. It was 60 pages in color. Midway through drawing it, I just was kind of was like, I don't want to be only able to do one, uh, two 60 page books a year. I wasn't telling enough stories fast enough for me. I mean, on top of that, I just wasn't enjoying the story at the time. I canceled it and then took a couple months off. I finished it. It's right here. I finished the book. Um, I'm, that's good. that's the orders I'm over. Pa I'm packaging right now over there. The book leaves off at a cliffhanger, and I knew that if it funded, which it did, and if people liked it, which they did, that they would then expect a volume two, and then a volume three, yeah. and a volume four. And I was just like, man, if I give the people this story, I'm married to it for the next five six years, hmm. and I just don't want to be. Whereas the girl with the mega fist. I'm married to it. We finished volume one. I have the book over there and I'm already working on volume two. So this is a series that I'm obsessed about that I want to, you know, just continue making. Uh, maybe I'll do chefs again. It's like that girlfriend that you, that's that girl that you like. And it's just not the right time to be with her. I think that's what it is with chefs right now. From what I've read with the girl with the mega fist and I got through about half of it. So I apologize. I couldn't get through 200 pages because my internet. You're good. good. It's a lot. <laughs> it, it's a lot, but it, it's entertaining. That's the main thing because thank you. there's a lot of these tales, a lot of these comics that I read because I like action. I like character development and no matter if it's a triangle like you have or if it's just a single individual going through the a new world or a new culture and all that other stuff i, I love those types of storylines and so you have a great combination between 
what feels like a mix of almost Attack on Titans versus uh, a bunch of other mangas that I, I enjoy and read to uh, in terms of what you're trying to put together. So I love the fact that you're you're successfully funded, that you're, you're passionate yeah. about this project and that you have great character interactions and world development as well too. One of the questions I did want to ask though here while we actually get into this comic itself here is looking at the world that you built what did you draw from to create the world so the first four volumes of this series take place in a place called the sanctuary and um, it's kind of like this big massive plot of land that hovers um, over earth and so all of these people that live in this place called the sanctuary they're there for one one reason, one reason only. They're there to support um, the gods. It, it's kind of like a religion. There's two factions of the gods, the mega the mega gods and the almighty gods, and each of these people are split into these factions, but they all help and support each other. And so they all are very stuck in their ways. They know, like, everyone knows the role that they play here. I kind of pulled from that was, um, you know, different religious communities where you'll have – various strong religious communities who are i'm not going to say stuck in their ways but we are like i'm religious but we know what we know what we're doing we know what what's going on and, and you kind of like don't ask questions um and so that's what the people of the sanctuary are and now that you have this kerfuffle between eliana having to choose between these two two brothers you're starting to get questions like why do i have to pick between these two brothers why can't i bring both of them why does it have to be one way when it could be another and so the world is constantly you know battling between like asking why and they're saying just because and so i pulled a lot of it from just you know my own experience being in um, various religious communities obviously religion has helped your creativity though but do you find any drawbacks to being religious and creative at the same time no no i don't but if any any person that reads any of my stories, they'll go, how is how can this guy be religious? Because mm. all of my stories have a theme of struggling with religion, except for Chefs. Chefs was like just this fun like superhero book that everyone had food powers. Uh, my series Demons, which is a um, fifteen issue series, it's about a guy who who his father is a priest and he is an atheist, and now as angels and demons are entering the world at war, it's like, how do I, how do I deal with the fact that I don't believe in these things? And yet they're here in my face. My graphic novel entity was about dissecting the, the ability that humans have to choose. And is it better for us to be controlled or to have, to have choice and which one would, would God want for us? And so I pull a lot from my own religious experiences and my own religion. And I kind of twist them into the stories to ask, you know, certain questions that I might be struggling with at the time. So then in your opinion, uh, what is the most important quality of a, of a comic writer or artist in today's comic? And how does that translate to your comic? Oh, that's a good question. Storytelling. I think storytelling. I think something that I feel like is lacking is storytelling. You can have the best art and have the worst story. Hmm. Like I haven't picked up a good DC or Marvel book. Maybe I just haven't found a good one. I've been very disappointed with a lot of the stories I've been picking up because it's not storytelling first. It's kind of like maybe like, oh, we just want to show off this one moment and that's the moment. Big, you know, whatever. What's the story though? Like what's happening? I want to see a character go from one type of person and then at the end, I want to see them become something else. For me, I think it's storytelling. It's the biggest focus that I, I try to focus on. Like my art, my art can always improve and I, I always strive to have my art, to, uh, art, art improve and, you know, my writing and my grammar could always be better i really think that my story is strong because you're seeing these characters develop from one person to a next um to a different person and we're doing that by th throwing in different events that are gonna change them yeah and, and you see the transition that's that's the great separation with with different comics these days is you feel like some maintain that same path that everyone else is doing that's the popular formula of the time but it's more difficult to set yourself apart from the rest when you create your own characters and your own your own vision for your comic itself 100 mm, 
I haven't really done good in the marketing of my book because this is a superhero story. The girl with the mega fist is a superhero story. She's super powerful. She's got power. She's going to come to earth and she's going to protect earth. She is a superhero. But what we're doing is the first four volumes are going to be her training arc where she's trying to learn her powers. What kind of person is she going to be? I think one thing that's, that is hard right now with comics is bat like bat. I love Batman. I on my whole bookshelf over there is basically Batman. But Batman is the world's greatest detective, world's greatest martial artist. And I'm like, dude, you still keep getting owned by a clown, a homeless <laughs> clown. Like, they're just like, we're like, at this point, you're just, you can't be the world's best anything because you're not. Or, you know, you have the Flash, the world's fastest man. And yet everyone's faster than the Flash. Um, Superman, the world's strongest. Like, to me, there's just no more character development with these stories. Um, like, I'm very pro kill Batman, have Dick Grayson become Batman have him figure out, have him, you know, hit his peak and then move on to the next um, for that story progression and that character development. You can't be, you can't develop if you're the world's best. There's nowhere to go. You're at the top. And yet clearly you're not at the top because you're losing to a homeless clown. I mean, that's probably why they have so many Robins because they can <laughs> do so many different things with multiple Robins than they can with the singular bat. Yeah, except I was looking at DC sol solicitations for May and like Batman is on every cover. Um, and I'm like, wow, like he is all over the place. Well, I mean, if the Batman thing doesn't work out, he could always go into OnlyFans, I guess. So, yeah, yes. I mean, he's got the body for it. <laughs> what was the first thing that you created that you made you realize that I could do this as a career? I was, I've been drawing comics since I was in like fourth grade. I have a comic that I made. I still have it. It's actually in my car is just drawn on printer, printer paper and a, a pencil. And I, it, it was, it's a 500 page comic. Wow. I have all 500 pages. I loved making comics growing up as a kid. And then in 2015, I was like, I'm going to, I want to make comics and I've been making comics religiously for the last seven years. And so only, I think only, I think this year now, me as a creator, it, you can you can be a producer of comics, make comics, have a silly goose time, have fun, make a character. I think this is the first year I feel like now I have a, a plan in place. Like I, I know what path I want to be on. And um, this is just phase one of that. The phase one was getting the first book out. I'm just hoping that this plan is good enough that in five or six years I can do this full time. But I think for the first several years, it was just me making books and not really knowing what to do. When I canceled Chefs, had this big mental breakdown, canceled my Kickstarter, and I, the reason, and I was just like, man, like I have no idea what I'm doing. What, like, what am I doing? What's my plan? Now that I have this plan, to you know, now that I have this plan, I feel like I'm on the right path um, for me as a creator. What triggered the plan, or how did you get the plan? I should say it's like it all came down from that from this book. This book me canceling this book was the catalyst of everything. It was, I wasn't having fun. Why am I not having fun? Oh, it's because I'm not working on a series that I want to be working on. Um, what kind of series do I want to work on? I want to work on something that has longevity and I can, I can spend like 20 or 30 pages on an action scene, or I can spend 20, 30 pages on two characters, just having a conversation. I couldn't do that with that book. Um, my friend, Brian Ball and his team at rags, they made a book that broke every rule in comic book in the comic book world. And they were having so much fun doing it. It just came down to the fact that I just wasn't happy with doing the same thing that everyone else was doing. And so I, Cancel my Kickstarter. Everyone was like, Tyler, you just gave away all that money. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm not happy. And I decided I'm going to have fun. I'm going to work on a series. And I'm going to do things my way. And since then, it's been great. Like, if this is a 60-page book, there's only so much you can do with the page count. But with The Girl with the Mega Fist, I can do whatever I, what I want. I had a fight that was only 10 pages. And when I started sketching it out, I was like, man, like, this is kind of a really boring fight because it's only 10 pages screw it i'm just gonna make it 36 pages because i can do whatever i want i just kept drawing until the fight ended and, and no one told me i couldn't do that because i wasn't constrained to a page count or anything um because ultimately the girl with the megafist is a web comic mm -hmm. um first because uh, my patrons get to read it i sent you that i sent you the link to where my patrons go to read mm -hmm. every two weeks i upload a new chapter if i want to make a chapter 14 pages or 20 pages i can um and then the page count of the growth the mega fist will be reflected so mm -hmm. yeah it really just came down to like you know i'm sick of all these rules arbitrary comic rules i'm just gonna do whatever i want 
Now that you have such creative freedom then in creating The Girl with the Mega Fists here, uh, what was the hardest scene for you to write? And then what was the hardest scene for you to draw? They don't have to be the same. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, hardest okay. scene to write? Jeez. I, I want to say none of them because it's just been so fun. I think the hardest scene to write, the first, the chapter zero was the hardest to draw and to write because it was kind of like this intro cut scene where I have to basically set up the world and the lore all in 12 pages. Mm. I had to draw it. And at the time I was trying to figure out how to draw the style that I wanted. And at the same time, I was designing everything on the fly. The faction of the almighty, they wear robes. Um, I just made that up on the fly. The faction of the mega, they wear like wolf fur things with capes. I just made that up on the fly and then it just stuck. It now stuck. I'm on the fly rider, man. Like I, like someone was asked me like several months ago, what was the reason why that there's these two twin brothers showed up instead of just one brother, like it always has. And I was like, Oh, you'll find out. And I hadn't, I had no idea. And only literally yesterday at work, I went, Oh, and I like typed it up real quick. That's kind of like how I write is throughout volume one, I've uh, made a bunch of like Easter eggs, like to things that, that are going to come. And yet I don't even know what they are. Um, I know they're going to come. There's a point where one of the, the, one of the characters goes like, don't trust the sanctuary. And um, someone messaged me. He's like, what does that mean? I'm like, oh, I mean, you're gonna have to find out just like me. I have to, I'm going to have to find that out. And I just found out like yesterday. Um, and like, there is a kid, there's like some kissing scenes or like, or like not kissing scenes, but like where they like people, like the the boys and girls have to like interact. And for some reason, I just can't draw. Every time I draw like them, like being close to each other, it looks like one of them's groping each other. <laughs> He's like, you know, her, his hands on her boob. And I'm like, it, it looks like that. It's not, it's on his shoulder and it's on her shoulder. And he's like, why is her shoulder on her boob? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. So some of those intimate poses um, were kind of hard for me to draw. But yeah, it's it, that those. So I think I think chapter zero was the hardest for me to write and draw. Look, anatomy is hard. Like playing. Yeah. Something. Like <laughs> yeah, we're we're getting better. <laughs> because you have the creative freedom that you have, and you're the one that's putting all of this together as well. Too. What did you edit out of these chapters and books that you may want to may have wanted to keep in? Nothing. When in my writing process is very. Um, not meticulous. It's very, I want to say it's loose. It's strict and loose. And what that means is my scripts are very loose and it's because I've done all the hard work before I even get to the scripting phase. And so like, I know already what every volume, what every volume, every arc is going to, every character development moment, every event, I already have it all written down. And I know the order of everything that's going to happen, when it's going to happen and why it's going to happen. And so when it comes to scripting, it literally is just, I look at my, my sheet and it says chapter five, there's a fight. And at the end of the fight, this happens that leads to chapter six. And then I just grab my tablet. I sketch out 12, 12 pages worth of art throw, And then after that, I look at the doodles, pull up a Google doc, throw in dialogue that makes sense. And then I start drawing. So I haven't taken out anything. Like my story is very like, this is what I wanted. I wanted to have this conversation. It takes 10 pages. I wanted this fight. It takes 36 pages. So I did everything that I wanted to do in this book. It almost has hints of like uh, Dragon Ball Z esque uh, aspects where they span, you know, massive fights over the course of five or six episodes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like, I like, I didn't want it just to be like a two page fight where it's like, we're done. I wanted it to be like, like the 36 page fight scene it's not like in the book it's not just like a you're just seeing these two people fight you're learning about these characters and you're learning about the world through this fight and you're learning about the lore in it so i'm using the fight as a vehicle to tell the story in volume two i think there, there's 13 chapters in every volume i think the first five chapters are pretty chill and then the last and then the next five are just a straight fight scene. I tell people that like that at the end of that fight scene, it's going to change all the characters for the rest of the story. Is this, this fight scene at the, um, at the end of volume two, it's going to change the characters completely. So in volume three, they're going to be completely different and they're going to be totally affected. And so I, I don't use the fight scenes as just like a, this fun thing to draw, although they're the, they are the most fun to draw. I use it as a vehicle to tell the story and to develop the characters. 
So then what's your creative kryptonite? Oh, I'll tell you, oh, you know what? It is my creative kryptonite. I hate working with people. I've said it a bunch of times. I hate working with people. Like anytime someone's like, Tyler, do you want to do a crossover? Like, no. Hey, do you want to do a cover with? No. Do you want to do like join our YouTube sh- like show? We have like our own network now. I hate working with people. And, I, and that's something I'm trying to get better at. Like with chefs, I was doing all the work. I should probably have just paid someone to color this. That was the worst part of this book was I colored everything. Um, and that was the most time consuming. And had I paid someone to color it, probably some of the the stress of producing that book would have gone. But I just don't like working with people. So what better than to do just a black and white book that I can do myself and not have to work with someone granted. I um, I work with an awesome colorist for like the covers and whatnot. Her name is Bia Navarro. She's just awesome. So I did go, okay, like I, I can't color as well, but you can. So you do the cover. Um, I did bring on an editor. His name is Patrick Dwyer. Um, and he was like, Hey, your spelling's bad. And I'm like, shut up. I hate you. Thank you. And he's like, Hey, like, this doesn't make sense. And I'm like, go kill yourself, Patrick. Like, don't tell me, don't tell me what to do. I don't want to work with anyone. Um, thank you, by the way, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so um, yeah, I hate, that's my, 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 my kryptonite is I, I hate working with people. Why is that though? <sighs> this, sounds, this sounds so bad. I don't think I, I don't think people work as hard as I do. Mm-hmm. Like it's my birthday. I'm down here. We're talking. We're having a silly goose time. I'm packaging orders for my Patreon. I'm, I record, you know, I pre-record two videos a week on YouTube. I, I study all my analytics. I still make time to do a 12 page comic every, every two weeks. I draw on my lunch break so I can put out um, a summer release comic of something else. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I have a Patreon. I have my own po- I have a separate podcast I do on my Patreon. So I, I just do all these things. And it's like, if I bring on someone, if you're not bringing that same energy, if you're not bringing, if you're not able to bring as much as I am to the table, then I don't want to work with you, which is kind of jacked up because, but that's, that's how it is for me is like, I'm obsessed with what I'm, what I'm doing. And if you're not obsessed, I don't necessarily want to work with you. Like my biggest thing right now with creators, I keep asking, I keep saying, Hey, you need to get a YouTube channel or a podcast. You got to get something because um, I mean, you get, you probably get messages all the time. Hey, can I come on a show? Hey, can I come on a show? Can I promote my stuff? Mm-hmm. And you're like, that's fine. That's fine. And for me, I'm like, I've done so many interviews and whatnot that I'm like, yeah, you can come on my show to promote your comic. Can I come on your show to promote my comic when it comes out? Oh, I don't have a show. Okay, that's fine. A year later, they come back. Hey, Tyler, can I promote my comic on your show? Yeah, yeah you absolutely can. Can I promote my comic on your show? I still don't have a show. So I, I'm like, man, like, we need something yeah. like, Give like, and so for me, that's why I hate working with people is I just feel like they're work they're, They don't work as hard as, as I do. I still have friends. I still have comic book friends that I still hang out with. I, I, I hang out and talk with them every single week. They're all doing their own thing. We're all, we're all doing our own thing, but even then they'll be like, Tyler, do you want to do something? No, I don't, I don't want to do it. Oh, but I understand that. I, the, no one's ever going to work as hard as you on the projects that you love. I mean, that's the reason why I've, I've been a solo host for 13 years, although I shouldn't say that. The first six years of the show or first five years of the show, I had a co-host. I had a wonderful co-host and Phil got me out of my introverted shell. I mean, life evolves. You evolve as a creative person. You evolve as a, you know, in, in what you're passionate about, whether it's writing, drawing, being a podcast host and interviewer, whatever the case may be, you're, you're always finding better ways to better yourself. And I think when it comes to being creative, you you have to control what you own. Um, That's really what it comes down extent. to is I'm, is I'm, is I think I'm controlling, <clears throat> but it's also like, like what you said is, is um, like, if you're wanting to take it to another level and that person just isn't ready then they're either going to hold you back or now you're, you're stuck. And I just never feel like, I just never want to feel like I'm, I have to rely on someone, you know, I never want to feel like crap. Like, why don't I, I want to share this cover this week, but it's stuck with the colorist. Like, gosh, like I should just color this myself or, you know, Oh, it's my, my, these pages are stuck with the letterer. Now, now, now I'm being held up because of someone else that I can't rely on. 
and like with you, you're like, I want to level up. So like you're over here right now with, with your podcast. And if someone goes, Hey, like, I want to get started. You're like, listen, I'm here. Like I can help you, but are you going to work as hard as I am? Are you going to ske- help me schedule? Are you going to be there when I'm doing all these interviews? Well, but that's the thing though. I mean, for, for me, I've, I knew that I was going to do this solo. I knew that mm-hmm. I was going to do this. And as much as things have been going amazing for the show now, three years ago, no, I, I'm, I'm still doing the same process. I'm just promoting myself a little more. I'm just being more interactive on social media. I'm, I'm still getting people. If it wasn't for Twitter, not killing my my post asking for people i wouldn't have you i wouldn't have the 50 others that have signed up till Uh july of this year that's awesome so something went my way somehow shape or form and i i thank everyone that comes on the show no matter if they have their own show or not but it comes back to you know you want to promote yourself because we're only here for a short amount of time You, you we can only showcase our talents to a certain amount of people whether the algorithm stops you or, or not, you're still pushing to promote yourself, no matter what the case may be. So I, you know, the fact that you're taking ownership of everything that you're doing, whether it's the podcast or whether it's the girl with the mega fists or whether it's whatever else you're going to create in the future, you're at least setting your own standard for yes. yourself as a creative person. Yes. And that's the thing is, yeah, that's, that's a big thing is I've set the standard for me and it's not fair for me to set that standard for anyone else. Mm-hmm. But that means that it's it, because I have such a high standard of work ethic for myself, I'm going to do it all myself until I find someone else who I can either trust or they're at that same level of work ethic with me. You know, opening yourself up to other people, if you've been hurt before in the past is very difficult mm-hmm. to do. Um, for sure. You know, it's, that's another psychology <laughs> lesson <laughs> in its own right here. We're, we're kind of veering off topic a little bit, but no, you're good. But it really comes back to um, you know this is this is how I've been successful in my in my lifetime and in, in what I'm creating. I know I can do better. I know I can improve. Whether whatever process of creativity I'm going to improve upon, um, I want to become a better person, no matter what the case may be. If you're willing to get to this certain level that I've, I've attained, or at least be helpful in maintaining my level of, of standards, then perfect. Let's work. Let's do something. hundred percent. Do you believe in creative block? Not, do you have creative block? Do you believe? I do. I do believe in it. I do believe in creative block and I experience creator block and um, Jake Parker, he's an awesome artist, and he has he he calls it the creative bank account, where every time that you come up with that you every time that you withdraw an idea and you start being creative, at some point your bank account's going to hit zero because you haven't made any deposits. I believe uh, I believe in that. So what I you know if you're constantly withdrawing, at some point you need to start depositing some creativity into your bank account. Paul T. Wrights at Paul T. Wrights said, what was the first seed of the story or image that popped into your head that would eventually develop into the girl with the mega fists? Yeah, I was at a work. I hate being in meetings. If I feel like a meeting is useless, I'll stand up and I go, I think this meeting's useless. If there's anything you need from me, come get me Um, and I'll walk out. I can only do that with some meetings and some meetings are inevitable. So I'm constantly doodling. This is like three months after I canceled my Kickstarter and I'm just like, I'm like itching for inspiration. I just got done watching a documentary about Mike Mignola. Mm -hmm. I started drawing this female in a crop top and I was like, Oh, this is kind of, this kind of fun. And then, um, when I went to go draw her arm, I was like, man, let me just draw these massive, just metal tech gauntlets. And they were just so big. And my coworker walked past and was like, um, oh, what's this? And I was like, oh, it's a, it's a girl with a mega fist. I'm like, oh, I kind of like the ring to that, the girl with the mega fist, because you kind of know what the story is about. It's about a girl with the mega fist. Um, but I had no story. Why does she have the mega fist? What can this mega fist do? And then you start building out that story and then you go, okay, 
does anyone get this mega fist? No, just select people. Okay, why? And you just start, I kept asking these questions and eventually you start building out the lore of the story. And now that you have the lore, you go, okay, there's a girl, she's got a mega fist. There's two factions, the gods, there's an almighty God. There's a mega God. They send out one male, one female every year and they protect earth. Okay, sweet. Standard, standard. What if the, the conflict was that this year around there was, instead of one male, one female, it was two males, one female, and she's got to pick between two twin brothers. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, okay, now we have conflict. What if she likes one of the brothers, but he's weaker and the other one's stronger? Okay, okay, there's conflict. And now what if their task is to protect Earth, meaning that she kind of has a responsibility to choose the one who's stronger, but she kind of wants to choose the one who has her heart. That's going to make her task difficult, and she's got like the gods who are like, you know, you better pick the right one. So now we have a story. Now we have conflict. And all that came from a doodle and me asking a couple questions. That was a good question, too, from uh, Paul T. Wright. So. Yeah, thanks, Paul. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to go a little more introspectively here. Uh, before I do that, is there anything that I haven't touched upon? And we'll talk about social media and all that stuff, where we can find you and where we can find the Kickstarter campaign. You'd like to tell those who are watching and listening to this interview. Oh, yeah, yeah. you guys, um, I'm most active on YouTube and Twitter. So uh, you can find me at youtube.com slash drawn talk, where I post videos about making comics, manga, commentary, and whatnot. And we do live shows every week. And then you can find me on Twitter at Tyler underscore C underscore world, where you can see my terrible opinions on things. Ah, sorry. I forgot to ask what your, what your show is all about. That's my, my mistake there. I apologize. Oh, you're good. My show's draw and talk. Most of it is like commentary on various um, indie comics, uh, community stuff. Um, I'll recommend books that I've read. And sometimes I'll just give my opinions on stuff. Like I posted a video recently, like this week actually, it was like, what I'd do if I was the president of DC Comics? Hmm. And I just laid out my own business plan. <laughs> and I was actually shocked that, that like couple, like several hundred people watched it. And I was shocked at the comments who were like, you know, this actually isn't that bad of an idea. So Discovery, before you, we do the merger, hit me up, fire whoever's president and, you know, I'll, I'll make things right. Become a consultant. There you go. Yes, yes. I'll be a consultant. My five hundred, my five hundred YouTube views qualify me um, for this big position. <laughs> At what point are we good enough? Never. You should never feel like you are good enough. That sounds harsh. If you say you are good enough, it means that you are perfect in whatever state you are in in your imperfections, which is fine. You know, you are good enough, but you should strive to always be better. So I hate when people say, just accept me for who you, who I am. And to me, I'm like, I accept you for who you are, but I also want you to be better. I want you to grow and be better. Are you good enough to me? Yeah, you are good enough where you are, but if you're in the same state that you're in right now in a year, then no, you're not good enough. You're, you need to, be better. That's me. That sounds a little dark and harsh. For me in comics, I'm never, I never want to be enough. I want, I'm hustling. I'm obsessed with making comics. And I want to be better. If I was good enough, I'd still be making this really crappy stick figure comic I made in 2015. What is something you think every person should experience once in their lifetime? Oh no, depression. <laughs> well, um, we already have that. Kind of- everyone has depression. You know what though? I think in Gosh, it sounds terrible. I think everyone should experience absolute chaos and just death. What I mean by this is I spent two years in Africa and there was this road and it was just piled with dead bodies. There's people walking down the street, a taxi filled with 20 people in it, rolled, killed everyone on the street and everyone in the car. When I look at that street and you see all these bodies, when people are complaining like, oh, I hate this country, I, I hate, you know, there are problems with this country and there's problems anywhere, but I will always go, yeah, but at least there's not a street filled with dead bodies that have been there for a day because there's no infrastructure to clean this up. When you've seen straight pro- poverty and, and war, I, w- I remember seeing some guy with like six six people or take this guy into a field and I'm like, what are they doing? This oh, They're, they're going to go kill him. Because he stole someone's trash can. Like, geez. 
Okay. I saw a guy get a tire put on him. And I'm like, why are they putting the tire on him? They go, oh, he slept with so-and-so's wife, so they're going to burn him with the tire on. And I'm like, okay, we got to get out of here. When you have those kind of experiences, it makes you grateful for what you have. And it makes you realize, you know, my life isn't really that hard. And I'm in a pretty good, it makes you grateful, makes you humble. And it makes you go, you know, I'm living a good life. Yeah, is life hard? Yeah, but I'm not seeing my next door neighbor get a tire put on them. And they're about to be burned and everyone's just going to watch. So that's, that's me. That, that I think having some real perspective on where, where you are in life. Now, if you're watching this and you're the next door neighbor with the tire on them. Yeah, I'm sorry. That sucks. <laughs> um, but you're watching this and you're on your phone eating some Doritos and go, yeah, my life is hard and I'm oppressed. No, you're not. That's those are my feelings. What do you believe stands between you and complete happiness? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, Yourself. I think yourself. You are in control of everything. And you might not think you are, but you are. And I always tell anyone, I hate my job. Quit. Is there a gun to your head? If there is not a gun to your head, you are in control. Now, does that mean that your that life's about to get a little harder for you to you know to 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 make some changes for hap- for happiness? Absolutely. I was talking to a dude and he was like, "Oh yeah, my life's really miserable. I hate working at Burger King." And I was like, "Oh, yeah. Well, I I can understand that." And he was like, "Yeah, and um I, you know, it just sucks and I spent you know 20 years at Del Taco, just you know, hated working there." I'm like, "How could you work at a place for 20 years and hate it? Why didn't you there's no gun to your head. No one's just like, stay at Del Taco. We'll make that half pound bean and cheese burrito for $1.09. Um, red sauce or green sauce. No one's doing that. You are in control of your happiness. But what you aren't in control of is how smooth that's going to, how smooth the transition between you and happiness is going to be. You're not in control of that, but you're in control of the choices that you can make to become happy. And I think a lot of times people choose to be conveniently sad and depressed over inconveniently and uncomfortably happy. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? My, I want to say my wife, my wife, um, my wife, because my, well, my, I think my wife and my kid, I was making comics before them. I think once I had a purpose in making stuff, that's when the inspiration started getting even better. Whereas I was making these books, I didn't really have good development. Not, you know, nothing was really going on. You get married and you have someone who's like, I really believe in your dream. So I'm like, crap, if this person believes in my dream, I need to work even harder. You know, like I'm I'm down here all the time drawing and I'm not hanging out with my wife and she's she's okay with that because she believes in my dream. Therefore, I need to put in just as much, I need to put in double the effort because of the sacrifice she's making. The same goes with, you know, having a kid and my wife's pregnant right now. We're having a second kid. So like, thank you. Um, so like the stakes are even higher for me to not just perform, but just to like, to better myself and my, me as a creator. So I'd say my, my family, my wife and my kids for sure. Happy birthday and a second kid on the way. <laughs> Thanks. <amazing>. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> See, good positives in your life. That's, that's, I nice. know. I know. I gave really depressing introspective answers and, but like, I'm a pretty happy person. From a professional perspective, you have created comic books. You have well successfully funded yet another Kickstarter campaign, and you are doing amazing work and continue to improve yourself from a, a creative perspective. So professionally, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Ooh, that's a good question. No, no, I don't. I know that I can always successfully do a Kickstarter. I know I can always successfully make a book. For me, my success, I think, will be when I can say that, oh, this the money I made was able to pay a bill, like a hospital bill, <laughs> or I can you know, quit my day job. So am I successful right now? No, I've, I've done a lot of successful things, and I do a lot of successful things, but I still don't think I'm successful. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you can either fail slow or you can fail fast. And so for chefs, I decided to fail fast. I canceled the Kickstarter, nicked, nicked in the butt, boom, get out of the way. For other things, I feel like I have failed slowly because it's just 
based off of like bad habits and things I don't want to do. So how I, how do I deal with failure? Um, I let them happen. I think if you don't fail, it means you didn't try. So I deal like I deal with failure and I have like a little notebook over here and it's kind of just like things I want to do things I did and then why it didn't work. (laughs) And a lot of the times it's when you, when you fail at something and if you write down why it, why, what, why it failed, you can kind of find out, okay, who, like, where, where did it go wrong? Cause I think things can happen that are successful. I think that you can be successful at something that you failed at. You might've just been missing like one key aspect. And then if he had done that one thing, it would have changed everything. So for me, if I fail, I fail hard, fail fast, get up and then get up and try again. The younger generation is looking at your work and is becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer, a comic artist, or something other creatively. Also, you have the young generation in, of course, your child, your new current child and your future child uh, are going to be in a creative household as well, too. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Good question. This is perfect. This is perfect. This is a perfect question because... Anyone who's listening to this, and if you're someone who wants to be creative, and especially if you want to get into comics, go on YouTube and watch the trailer, Hustle. It's got Adam Sandler. It's a basketball trailer. And if you take out the, the, if you listen, if you watch the trailer, close your eyes and take out all the references of basketball, and there's really only one, but you listen to Adam Sandler's speech, you will be, you will realize what it takes to get into comics and be creative. And so, um, my advice is if you're going to be creative and if you're going to want to do comics, whether you're writing it or drawing them and you want to be successful in them, you need to be obsessed. You need to be obsessed with comics. You need to, you know, you could be talented, but obsession will always beat talent because you can be talented, but are you obsessed? You actually want to do this. So, for me, when people, when I want to be known as that creator and I'm kind of starting, this is kind of like my phase one this year of this new plan, but I want people to go, Tyler is that guy who is obsessed with making comics. He puts out three, 200 page books a year. He is obsessed with making comics and he makes good comics and they're fun and they're really well written and they're really well drawn. How can he do 600 page, 600 pages worth of comics every single year? And the answer I want is because I'm obsessed with that. And so for future generations of writers and artists, are you obsessed with what you're doing? Cause if you're not you're not going to be successful. You can have fun. You can go have a silly goose time. Say I made a comic and there you go. But if you want to take this to this to the next level, you need to be obsessed with it. And that's with anything in life. If, if you know, I'm in marketing. Um, am I obsessed with marketing a little bit because it's, you know, it's my day job. And so I'm constantly trying to learn new techniques, but if you're, if you want to become a YouTuber, if you want to be a TikTok TikToker, you need to be obsessed with it. You need to be obsessed with the process. You need to be obsessed with the creation of it. And you need to be obsessed with the failures and success of it. Well, you there just you piqued my interest on another quick question then. Yeah, let's do it. What's the most misunderstood aspect about being a marketer in today's social media platforms? The numbers of it. You can have a million followers and still no one knows who you are. You know, would you rather have a million followers and only a thousand people know you, or would you rather have 500 people follow you and 500 people like you in marketing? You know, there's tons of vanity numbers. Um, my social media that I, the, the, the company I work for that I do their marketing for, we have like 300 followers. I brought in a million dollars based off of the content I made. It's not about the follow. It's about how you connect with people. I have 5,000 subscribers on my YouTube and it's constantly growing every day. And yet... I don't get 5,000 views. So something's missing with either my videos and maybe not con- like reconnecting with these people, I, you know, and that's something that I need to work on. And most of the time, cause all my marketing efforts are focused at work. <laughs> if you start getting lost in the numbers on views, on followers, on subscribers, those are all vanity metrics. They don't matter. No one cares. People, people kind of care, but you shouldn't care because what you should be care. You, what you should care about is your, is what's coming in um, monetarily. So if I can say, yeah, I did. A, I have a you know social media following at my work of 300 people. Yeah, I was bringing in a million dollars in revenue. 
the question should be, shouldn't be, how did you monetize those 300? It's, it's what kind of content were you making to generate three, a million dollars with so few followers? So don't get stuck in the vanity metrics. I know some people, me included, will, will do that. Well, I do hate to say this, Tyler, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I do want to thank you so much for coming on your birthday and and promoting yourself as you are an amazingly talented person and and happy birthday. Thank you. Like, I really appreciate it. this. Was a really this? I think this will be this is definitely my top three best interviews I've ever had out of the seven years I've done this. I think this is top three uh-huh. um, interviews I've done. So, so I did, I, big, did I get gold, silver, or bronze? Uh, you definitely got. You're definitely in the gold. Okay. Um, it was good. Yes. Yes. Some really good questions. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed being here. Thank you so much. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And, and I didn't get to ask this earlier. When is the Kickstarter ending? Because I oh. want to see, get you more support that you definitely deserve. You can find me at youtube.com slash draw and talk where I upload um, two, uh, one or two videos a week. And we do a weekly live stream. You can also find me at um, Tyler underscore C underscore world on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and then you can find my book, the girl with the mega fist on Kickstarter. It, it lasts until March 12th. And then on March 16th, we'll put out an Indiegogo and um, you can support it there. And then if you, can't make if you watch this way in the future and you can't support any of those two it'll be on amazon at some point but yeah the the kickstarter and indiegogo books there it's 200 pages for it's 200 pages and you only have to pay 15 dollars standard um i try to really get that price point down for people um so yeah 15 dollars will get you a 200 page um graphic novel it's 100 percent completed and um, i think it's a really strong story it's female led um the girl with the mega fist um you know follows um a girl just like you and me who um is struggling to find her place in this world and um you know she just wants to be a better version of herself and hopefully you want to be a version better version of yourself too well i i I love it i think it's a it's a great story a great comic i i love to see that it's it's complete and that's always a wonderful thing to see there are no cliffhangers currently and i want you to keep being uh, passionate and successful with whatever you decide to create which also means that you have to come back on the show which means I need a new batch of questions to dive into your mindset. <laughs> and that means that we got to get you back on more than once. So we'll do it. I'll hit you up anytime I got something going. Awesome. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a little more updated than our website because I'm restructuring the website at youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.